Well, it's great to be here, and uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a good program for today. I'm excited to be part of it. Um, well, this is the title I've been given, and I'm going to start by showing this picture. I think uh, most people, um, and I hope most people in the room would recognize the person on the right, which is, of course, Albert Einstein. Um, but not many people, I suspect, will recognize the person on the left, unless you're a specialist astrophysicist or cosmologist. Because that is uh, Georges Lemaitre. He was a Catholic priest, as you can tell, and he was the father of the Big Bang Theory. He was a great cosmologist. He sold Einstein's equations of general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, for the universe as a whole, and came up with an expanding universe solution. Um, that was in 1927. In 1929, the expansion was observed by Edwin Hubble in the US. And then in 1931, Lemaitre came up with a further solution where the expansion started from a highly dense compact state, which he called the primeval atom. It was christened Big Bang um, a few years later by Fred Hoyle, uh, the Cambridge astrophysicist who certainly didn't like the idea and uh, proposed instead the so-called steady state theory. Well, the Big Bang, um, as I say, was predicted by the match and it, uh, the Big Bang theory is extremely well supported by evidence. Uh, the expansion was the first piece of evidence. That wasn't enough for Hoyle and various colleagues who produced this, as I say, steady state theory instead. And they explained the expansion by having new matter come into the spaces between the galaxies as these move apart. And so for Hoyle et al., the universe looks the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I suspect we would have a rather different take on that. Well, uh, the clinching piece of evidence was the cosmic background radiation that was observed in 1965. This had been predicted in 1948 uh, by a, a team of astrophysicists in uh, the US um, surrounding uh, George Gamow. Uh, the idea is if the universe started off in a highly compact state, it would have been very hot. And as it expanded, basically, it would have cooled down and left behind this remnant radiation. And this was observed in 1965, as I say, by these chaps, Penzias and Wilson. And uh, they got the Nobel Prize for this. They thought that what they discovered was um, bird droppings in their antenna <laughs> turned out to be the uh, remnant radiation from the Big Bang. I mean, this is um, an astonishing uh, and wonderful discovery. And it couldn't be predicted on the basis of the steady state. There was no way of explaining it on the basis of the steady state. So this was the clinching piece of evidence of the Big Bang. And there's, there's lots more evidence beside. Um, and let me just give you a feel for what's being talked about in cosmology. This is a typical galaxy. Um, if it were our own galaxy, obviously we can't look at our galaxy from outside like this. But, but our galaxy would look like this if we could. Uh, that has something like 100,000 million stars in it, 100 billion stars, and there are about 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So that gives you some idea of the scale. We now know the age of the universe to be 13.8 billion years. Uh, that's been refined and refined, and that's the latest estimate with the Planck satellite. This is a truly remarkable picture, I think. Um, might look like a few um, you know, little splodges uh, here and there. Never mind. Um, but anyway, all these little splodges are galaxies. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the point is that they are the earliest galaxies to form in the universe. This is a picture of the universe as it was about when it was about 500 million years old, half a billion years old. Um, and um, you know, five percent of its present age. Uh, and these are the earliest galaxies to form. Now, um, what happens is that as the universe expands, um, there are little instabilities in the density of matter, 
uh, clumped together to form galaxies and form stars. The first generations of stars explode as supernovae and uh, they've cooked all the chemical elements of which we're made. And when a supernova explodes, you get something like this and all that material that's been manufactured, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and so on, the chemical elements that are necessary for life are made available so that subsequent generations of stars can have planets and maybe even life. This is another example where um, the central star has come to the end of its life and shed um, a lot of material. There's uh, been a gigantic shock wave which has hit the surrounding gas and lit it up to produce that necklace effect. And it seems to me there are two main questions that all this raises for theology. One is uh, that the universe began to exist and that seems to have some implications possibly and the other is that the universe looks as though it was set up in a very particular way so that it might give rise to life the so-called fine tuning i'm going to say a bit about both um, uh, first of all the beginning well according to uh, saint augustine writing in the early fifth century the world was made not in time, but simultaneously with time. Um, so space, time and matter came into existence together, uh, according to one of the greatest theologians of the Christian Church. And um, Stephen Hawking has a very, very peculiar take on this in his book, The, the Grand Design. He quotes Augustine rightly, but says that... Uh, that's fine for you know, someone who takes the Genesis story literally, but the Big Bang, uh, and that's fine as a model, but the Big Bang is just more useful. Um, that's so confused because Augustine didn't take Genesis 1 literally, and this is precisely what the Big Bang seems to be saying, you know, um, millennium and a half later. Uh, well, um, in his book, uh, The Grand Design, and in, indeed in A Brief History of Time, Hawking tries to get round the issue of the beginning. Uh, he proposes uh, what he calls the no boundary proposal. Uh, time becomes imaginary, and uh, that, uh, the, in the technical, mathematical sense of imaginary numbers. Uh, but physical quantities, physical things that you actually measure, uh, are not, well, if you, if you get an imaginary number, you normally think you've, you've done something wrong. Imaginary numbers can be useful uh, uh, you know, for calculating devices. And in, in some places, Hawking says precisely that, that this, these imaginary numbers, they're useful for calculating things, but uh, we can t pick or choose as to whether we take them as real. But he also tries to make philosophical capital out of this. And he says, so long as the universe had a beginning, we could suppose that it had a creator. But if the universe is really completely self-contained, having no boundary or edge, it would have neither beginning nor end. It would simply be what place then for a creator. Uh, and indeed, um, for Hawking, God's only possible role is to light the blue touch paper at the beginning and set it going. Now, I've already begun to describe some of the philosophical problems with this uh, imaginary time. Um, there are deep problems, scientifically and philosophically, with treating uh, time as imaginary. And Hawking, uh, you know, as I say, uh, and also seems to say, well, you can pick or choose as to whether you take it as ontologically real or not, in which case this, go this whole thing goes away, doesn't it? Um, but in any case, there are, there are scientific problems. At Hawking's uh, 60th, uh, no, 70th birthday party symposium um, at the beginning of last year, Hawking sadly was ill, but sent a message saying, well, if the universe had a beginning, then it would need a creator. Um, and uh, this man, Alexander Vilenkin, was there, and he's pr proved certain singularity theorems which show that uh, in his words, as he said at the symposium, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. So, 
at the moment, it certainly looks as though the universe did really have a beginning, and that is a, a problem for, for atheists. Um, but even if it didn't, uh, there would be a problem for atheists, it seems to me. There's no argument from a beginning to atheism, that's for sure, uh, from, from no beginning to atheism. That doesn't work because... Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said it by faith. We can't actually prove that it had, the universe had a beginning. We hold that by faith. But nevertheless, even if the universe was eternally back, went eternally backwards in time, you would still need a cause of the whole sequence, whether it's a finite sequence starting a finite time ago or an infinite sequence going back infinitely far in time, it needs a cause for it to exist. God is the reason for the universe to exist at every moment, not just at one special moment, if there was one at the Big Bang. Um, and so, uh, that brings me to the topic of ultimate explanation, which is in the title of the talk. An ultimate explanation is an answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And according, again, to Aquinas, God provides the answer to that question because God is necessary. This is a philosophical term, which means that God cannot but exist. Um, there never was when God was not. God is eternal. Um, and that's part of what we mean by the concept of God. Um, the idea that God, was, well, God was created is nonsense. You know, Steve, uh, Richard Dawkins says, well, you know, who created God then? But that's to misunderstand the meaning of the term God. Um, anything that's created is not God. So we can have debates about whether a necessary being, God, exists or not. But if he does, then it's meaningless to ask who created God. Um, now, the universe is quite different. Um, the universe is contingent, meaning that it may or may not have existed and it could be different from what it is. So... Um, God, as a necessary being, explains why there should be um, a universe, a, a contingent universe. Um, and Hawking, even, and some of his colleagues have recognised this particular point. Hawking seemed to recognise this back in a brief history of time. He seems to be reneging on it now, but... In a brief history of time, he said, what is it that breathes life into the equations for there to be a universe for them to describe? Martin Rees, his colleague, says such questions. Why there is something but rather than nothing lie beyond science? They're the province of philosophers and theologians. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Dennis Sharma, who uh, supervised the theses of Hawking and Rees, and uh, also Rodney Holder, as it happens, uh, said, none of us can understand why there is a universe at all, why anything should exist. That's the ultimate question. It's not a question that can be answered by science. It's a theological or philosophical question. All three of these, uh, Hawking, Rees, and Sharma, Sharma sadly died in his early 70s, but all, all of them are or were atheists, and yet they have each recognised this fundamental point. We can't explain why there is a universe. So ultimate explanation is the province of theology. Now that brings me then to um, the fine-tuning, the second major area of interest for theology, I think. And this relates to two kinds of data, if you like. The con initial conditions right back at the Big Bang, at the earliest time we can speak about, and the physical constants, the strengths of the various forces of nature. The, um, uh, 
masses of the fundamental particles, uh, and so on. These have to take the values they do in fact take to high degrees of accuracy in order for the universe to produce stars and galaxies and life. So the process of the manufacture of the chemical elements and so on, all these things need to be just right in order for the universe to, to give rise to life at some point within it. And I will give you a couple of examples at any rate. There are, um, there are many. Um, incidentally, I have brought my book, my latest book along, which was published last week, and I give a dozen examples in that. Um, that's, uh, if you're, I'm just a, a brief plug. Um, <laughs> at bargain basement, fully discounted price of six pounds. I mean, you know, goodness. Uh, but let me, let me give a couple of examples now. I'll, I'll give more later on in the talk. But the, um, the mean density of stuff, matter, energy in the universe, needs to be just right to one part in 10 to the power 15, right back at the beginning, one second after the origin, in order for the universe to give rise to life. Now, the universe is remarkably smooth. I mean, it doesn't look entirely smooth since you've got clumps of matter, galaxies and so on, but the largest scale is smooth, and it needs to be that way. And um, the density needs to be uniform and very close to a certain critical value in order for the universe to give rise to life. If, if the density is above this, this critical value by more than this tiny amount, then the universe will recollapse. Gravity will be strong enough to pull it back and will recollapse far too quickly for galaxies, stars and life to, to happen. And if the density falls below the critical value, then Gravity won't be strong enough to pull it back. It'll expand forever, but it'll expand far too fast for anything interesting to happen. So it's a very fine balance. And then um, a particularly interesting one is to do with the strong nuclear force, which is the force that uh, holds atomic nuclei together. Now, if this were to vary by more than half a percent, you wouldn't get carbon and oxygen in the universe. In fact, it's a, it's a very fine, it, it, this gives rise to remarkable balances in the way that the chemical elements are built up. Carbon is made from, inside the, the interiors of stars, from crashing three helium nuclei together and making them stick. And that is very difficult. Um, because if you crash two onto e on, uh, together, that's beryllium, and it lasts for 10 to the minus 17 seconds. You've got a fleeting fraction of a second to crash a third one on and make carbon. Um, and so it needs uh, an enhanced effect called a resonance to make that, go, that reaction go fast. But then oxygen, it, it's a double coincidence, if you like, because oxygen is made from crashing a fourth one on. But if there were a resonance in the oxygen atom at the, at the same, a similar kind of effect there, then you'd get all the carbon destroyed in making oxygen. So you would, only get, you would not have any carbon. So no long chain molecules, um, no DNA. Um, and the really fascinating thing is, is who discovered this? It was none other than our friend Fred Hoyle. Uh, who was the, ath the atheist cosmologist behind the steady state theory with other atheist colleagues as it happens. Hoyle was a militant atheist. He broadcast on the BBC in the late 40s and early 50s saying that religion is an illusion. He uh, said he had solved the Northern Ireland problem by locking up all those priests and ministers because you've got those Catholics te teaching nonsense to their, in their schools and their churches. You've got the Protestants teaching nonsense and teaching different nonsense, but it's all nonsense, okay? So that, well, that, that was his attitude to religion. But when he discovered the, the way that carbon and oxygen are made in stars, he said, a super intellect with, uh, has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. He said that this discovery was the biggest thing that had shaken his atheism, really shaken 
his uh, atheistic stance. And the universe is a put-up job. He couldn't, he says, believe that it was a monstrous sequence of accidents. That's the alternative. A monstrous sequence of accidents. Now, um, <clears throat> Something seems to be going on here. There are lots and lots of examples of this kind of thing, and I'll come to one or two more, as I say. But uh, something seems to be going on. Paul Davis has said about it. He's a cosmologist who's very impressed by this. Um, no, not a religious believer, but you know, something's going on. Something is explaining. He said, like the porridge in the tale of Goldilocks and the three bears, the universe seems to be just right for life in so many intriguing ways. Um, so, what explanations might be on offer? Well, there's a very um, obvious one, that God designed the universe with purposes and intentions for it, that it would produce intelligent creatures able to have a relationship with him, able to, have, to speculate on it all. Um, so, if you're an atheist, what alternatives are open to you? Uh, and I think there are two main ones. The first is to say that only one set of laws or constants is possible. That you know, um, maybe we will get uh, a better theory which calculates all these numbers that I'm talking about, the strengths of the forces and so on. Maybe they can't vary. Maybe the idea that um, the strong nuclear force could vary in, in, in some vast range is, is wrong. And, it, it, and uh, there'll be a better theory which calculates it. Um, maybe even, you know, that, that still leaves you with a problem because you've still got the laws of nature. Um, <clears throat> you, you'd have to go on to say, well, maybe there's only one self-consistent set of laws even. Uh, if you're really wanting to say that you, you've solved the fine-tuning problem. Um, but then, of course, Einstein uh, said, what I'm looking for <clears throat> is, what I'm really interested in is whether God could have made the world in a different way. Uh, uh, and that doesn't preclude God from making it. It just means that, that it's very odd that God has no choice in the kind of universe that he makes. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> with the first of those proposals, if, if, you, if you have a better theory which calculates the numbers, then all you've done is really shift the problem from the fine-tuning into the theory. And you've then got to ask, well, why does that theory apply to the universe? You haven't really got rid of the problem. Um, now, the, and to say that there's only one self-consistent set of laws seems highly implausible. And indeed, um, the um, majority of, uh, I think, uh, cosmologists who want to avoid um, you know, the design conclusion, go for the second strategy, which is to say, diametrically opposed to the first, that, uh, yeah, the constants can take all, lots of different values, and they do they, in, in a multiverse, uh, a vast, usually infinite collection of universes where these constants take all the values they possibly could take. Um, and I think, and I'll come on to, to some problems, but you know, if, uh, if if there's only one set of laws possible, then that would be deeply puzzling, I think. Um, because you'd, you'd ask, well, why does that unique self-consistent set of laws give rise to life? We can imagine um, other, other kinds of universe in which there are just maybe um, you know, some fundamental particles floating about in otherwise empty space, not interacting or the universe consists of just a single piece of rock or something. You know, it's, it would be deeply puzzling um, that the only self-consistent set of laws gave rise to life. And for the second strategy, the multiverse, you, can, you still have a choice to make. Why this multiverse as opposed to another multiverse? Um, you, even if you have infinitely many universes, there are many ways of choosing an infinity of numbers you can, um, uh, or, or of universes. Uh, if, if, if it's about choosing numbers, for example, you can choose all the odd numbers or choose all the even numbers. Those, those are infinite sets. 
Uh, but even if you choose all, all the integers, uh, you've far from exhausted the possible choices of, uh, you, you know, the, the possible sets of numbers. Then you've got rational numbers, real numbers, and so on. Okay. Um, so, in fact, again, you're driven, if you really want to solve the fine-tuning problem, uh, and you want to go for a multiverse, you've got to say that every kind of multiverse exists. Then, of course, you guarantee that this universe with its particular set of parameters exists. Uh, I'll go into some of the problems, but I think it's pretty obvious from the word go that that's a very extravagant solution to um, you know, explaining the particularity of this universe. Um, and it's not even a, really a coherent idea. Um, you can't... Uh, and not every universe can exist. A universe in which I'm here today speaking uh, on um, multiverses and so on uh, is different from the universe in which I decided to stay home and uh, you know, have a, an extra lie-in. Um, that's a different universe. And both of them can't exist. Maybe some copy of me in another universe could, be, could have stayed at home. But I am here now. So there's a, there's a conflict between what you know, that universes can actually exist. So, in cosmology, these two kinds of explanation are rather alternating. Um, Alan Guth um, has proposed the theory of inflation. Uh, and what this diagram does, this is time on this axis, the universe, uh, 13 point, it should be 13.8, and that says 13.7, but... Uh, and and, and uh, you've got the dimension of the universe um, that, that way. And the idea is in the very first 10 to the minus 32 seconds from the origin, the universe underwent an incredibly rapid period of expansion. And the idea of that is that it drives the universe towards this uniform state that it needs to be in in order to produce life. In particular, it drives the density to the critical value. Uh, and so it uh, solves one of the um, at least one of the, um, the problems, the fine-tuning you know, coincidences. Trouble is, as I say, what you've done is you've shifted the um, fine-tuning from that, that uh, initial condition into the theory that produces that initial condition. So you haven't really solved the problem. And indeed, it was found that, well, inflation has to be set up in a special way for it to do this. Um, so the solution that people like Andre Linder uh, at Stanford have gone in for is to go for multi a multiverse version of inflation, to say, okay, well, maybe we are in some vast, infinite, overarching space in which there are lots of different regions, some of which inflate, but they inf uh, inflate at different rates and so on. Some inflate, you know, some tiny fraction will inflate at just the right rate to give you know, our particular universe with its set of parameters the vast majority won't. Um, and then that's a chaotic inflation and internal, eternal inflation says even within these, bu these universes bubbling out of this background, there'll be new universes formed. So a vast network of universes bubbling up uh, ad infinitum. Um, so a multiverse version of, of inflation. And then there's a further development which is worth mentioning. This is a man called Levin Suskind, again working at Stanford. Um, and he um, is one of the pioneers of string theory. If you read about string theory, super string theory, M theory, this is all, uh, this, it, 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 they're all variants of the same thing. M theory is a generalization of string theory according to which matter it comprises tiny vibrating strings, and the different way the strings vibrate gives rise to di different particles. Par particles aren't little points anymore. But, I mean, we can't uh, actually measure anything on the scale of these, these finite vibrating strings. They're so, they're so tiny that we can't measure them. They're beyond a measurable threshold. Um, also, many dimensions are invoked, uh, 10, 11 dimensions. Again, we can't see other than the three spatial dimensions that we are accustomed to. These other dimensions are curled up very, very, very tiny. The theory isn't self-consistent unless you have more than three space dimensions. But we know um, that if there are more than three, 
you know, you know that's, a, that's, that's one of the fine tunings. We can't uh, exist in other than a three-dimensional universe. So if these other dimensions actually exist, they have to be curled up so tiny as to be unmeasurable. Now, um, a problem uh, for this theory is that it has made no predictions. It was criticized by the great Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman 30 odd years ago for that reason, and it still made no predictions. Suskind and his colleagues see that as a strength, and they move to, lo and behold, a multiverse version of string theory called the landscape. And they reckon there are maybe 10 to the 500 solutions of this theory, and uh, these all exist, these are all instantiated in universes. So, and uh, these, uh, if you like, this combines with inflation so that the different uh, bubble universes in inflation um, are different uh, solutions, represent different solutions to string theory. Now, there are quite a, quite a few other theories out there. Uh, the Big Bang, the basic paradigm, uh, that, that has massive evidence going for it. These are refinements. They are trying to take you maybe back beyond the Big Bang. They're trying to say there are lots of Big Bangs or whatever. Uh, but, a, but a lot of these um, refinements are at the very edge of speculation. Um, and that's uh, led uh, this particular physicist, Led Landau, uh, to say cosmologists are often in error but seldom in doubt, which is, <laughs> which is a rather fun quote, I think. Um, now, I happen to be in the um, Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg just a couple of months ago. Uh, and I saw a picture of Lev Landau, a great Russian physicist, and he, and he was looking somewhat, somewhat exotic, like, uh, like in that picture. I was rather pleased to see. I've got that one off the web, of course, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's him for real. Um, now, I think there are lots of problems for multiverses, this whole concept of multiverses. The physics is speculative. Um, the Large Hadron Collider takes us back to maybe a billionth or a trillionth of a second and imitates conditions in the universe at that particular time. These theories are taking us back to 10 to the minus 32 seconds, 10 to the minus 43 seconds from the origin, these speculative theories. You'd need an accelerator the size of the galaxy to reproduce the energies involved then. Um, Martin Rees, whom I mentioned before, is... Um, very interesting. Um, he says in one of his books that he's a cautious empiricist, meaning that he accepts cosmology from the time we, when we really understand the physics. And he was saying, you know, that then about a, a thousandth of a second from the origin. I mean, that's utterly remarkable in itself. I mean, you know, um, amazing that we can understand the physics going back to the th a thousandth of a second, or you know, as I've said even before that, now a billionth of a second, um, uh, fr from the Big Bang. Uh, but, but in fact, we can, we can. That, that, that's truly remarkable. Nevertheless, Rees opts for a multiverse, even though he says it's only a hunch and speculative, uh, because he wants to avoid the need for God as designer. It's a, it's the cho a choice he makes. Uh, then there's a problem about infinities. I already sort of hinted at uh, one or two problems to do with infinities. Um, but there are lots of paradoxes once you start getting into the realm of physical things, you know, infinitely <coughs> many physical things. <clears throat> Mathematicians play around with infinity and different degrees of infinity. There's a whole um, set theory of, inf of infinity. But when you have real infinities in the physical world, then you start to hit problems. David Hilbert, the great uh, German mathematician, ran a hotel which had infinitely many rooms. And they were all full. And then, lo and behold, a new guest comes along. He turns up a reception wanting a room. So what does Hilbert do? He says, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll move the person in room one to room two, the person in room two to room four, the person in room three to room six, and so on. Lo and behold, all the even-numbered rooms are full, all the odd-numbered rooms are empty. I've got room for infinitely many new guests. 
So that tells you something about infinity. Uh, you can always add to an infinity. Infinity isn't just a big number, um, the largest number we can think of or something. There's a, it, it's a qualitatively different thing from uh, a, a, a large finite number. There's the problem about human identity I referred to. There will, you know, in, in a multiverse, there will be copies of me. Uh, give, you know, some giving lectures on uh, multiverses as ultimate explanations, some lying at home in bed, some dropping down dead in the middle of the talk, and, and so on. You know, there will be, there'll be a whole collection of these, uh, these universes. And this raises problems, I think, because if these... Um, copies are identically constituted to me, and they make every decision I could make, doesn't that somewhat undermine our concepts of <clears throat> what it means to have free will and so on? So I worry about, uh, about this. <clears throat> I don't think it, I'm not sure that this actually precludes the idea of multiverses. But it makes them um, well. If you can have a, a, a metaphysical theory of theory that's that's simpler, that doesn't have these paradoxes, then I think surely that's to be preferred. For the kinds of reasons I've been explaining, I don't think a, a, a multiverse is a simple explanation. It violates the principle of Occam's razor that you should only um, use the minimum number of entities required to do the explanatory job in hand. Um, it's complex. It um, leads you down a very funny path um, in terms of doing science. You can find some odd feature in your laboratory, perhaps, that uh, is very unusual and, in, and you can't explain it. You can be tempted, if you're a multiverse believer, to say, ah, well, now this thing, this odd happening will happen in some universe somewhere and maybe that's the universe we're in sometimes we're told and dennis may talk about uh, god of the gaps sometimes we're taught we, we're we're, we're um, you know told that we shouldn't accept a god of the gaps well there's a there's a multiverse of the gaps um invoking a multiverse to do um an explanatory job rather than doing what one might call normal science um, and uh, as, again, as soon as you go down this route of multiverses, there are more disordered universes than there are ordered ones. There are more universes in which things just decay uh, into uh, chaos and confusion in the next 10 seconds or 20 seconds or uh, 24 hours and so on at any particular point in time. Um, then there are universes which continue, which have been going, do continue on in an ordered and structured way. Uh, science is based on the principle of induction that basically tomorrow does resemble today. That is a deep mystery um, because most universes won't be like that in the space of possible universes. Um, there's a problem to do with the cosmological constant. This was uh, introduced by Einstein as an extra term in his equations uh, in order to get a static universe, a universe that was eternal and the same yesterday, today, and forever. Einstein didn't like the Big Bang. He, he, he set this cosmological constant to a particular value in order to avoid it. Later repudiated that, though, and uh, did accept a Big Bang uh, kind of solution. Uh, turns out that this cosmological constant does now take a small finite value. Um, and a couple of physicists uh, two years ago, three years ago now, got the Nobel Prize for discovering that. that the, the expansion is speeding up. If you remember that picture of inflation, uh, uh, you know, as we get uh, nearer to now, the universe has started to speed up. Well, uh, the problem is that physicists think they know what this cosmological constant is. It's the energy associated with the vacuum. It does have energy. It's not nothing. Um, and they calculate it to be 10 to the power 120 times uh, too, too big to be compatible with observation. Indeed, to be compatible with our existence. If it were anything like that value, our bodies would fly apart uh, to the opposite ends of the universe before I could click my fingers. 
Um, we couldn't come into existence in the first place, of course, if it took the calculated value. So that's a deep mystery. Um, and um, uh, it looks very, very small, as if something is cancelling out the, this uh, uh, um, uh, vacuum energy factor to a very, very, very high, you know, large number of significant figures. It looks like ultra fine tuning. And there, there are attempts to explain that by a multiverse, um, saying all possible values of the cosmological constant get instantiated in universes. Um, and uh, well, I won't go into any more of that. It's, I think it's 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 an area where where multiverses come closest to to actually achieving a a, 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 a prediction. But um, and that's because the cosmological constant, the, the value that's compatible with our existence, is maybe ten or a hundred times the calculated value. Um, and uh, the value it takes is is ought to be sort of somewhere in the middle of that range. It still looks a bit special, but not ultra special. Um, but other parameters do look too special, as I, I, I'll, uh, I'll explain that. Now, to get uh, an infinite overarching space in the first place, some fine tuning is required. The mean density, overall density of stuff in the whole space needs to be below the critical value. It needs to be in a small range. Um, up to the to the to the to the critical value, otherwise you get a finite universe. If the um, the value is above the um, if the value is above the, um, the the critical value, then the universe will be finite, not infinite. Um, so that that's that's a problem. Um, then. There's the amount of order in the universe, which I think is a, this, this one is actually a killer for, um, for, for multiverse explanations. The universe needed to start off highly ordered in order for it to give rise to galaxies, stars, and life. This is the second law of thermodynamics, that the universe is going from order to disorder. Um, so if you knock a cup of coffee off the table and it spills, you get water diffusing into a carpet or whatever. That's, you know, that's what you, you see. That's what happens. What you don't see um, is, you know, water that's diffused into a carpet jumping back up into a, a, a broken cup, the cup forming again and it jumping back onto the table. You know you're watching a film backwards or the Harry Potter film or something where if you see that happening, that's not the real world. The real world goes from order to disorder. And so it needed to start off with a high degree of order. And Roger Penrose, um, the um, emeritus professor of um, uh, uh, mathematics at, at Oxford, a great cosmologist, says that the universe needed 10, well, the creator, the way he puts it is the creator metaphorical for him, creator had of the order of 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 123 universe configurations to choose from, only one of which would have been as ordered and structured as ours is. Absolutely minuscule fraction of possibilities that are ordered. But the problem is worse. Because on the basis of a multiverse, uh, so, you know, ordered universes will exist. But there will be universes in which we could exist that will be much less ordered than ours. You can crash together, you know, you can just have a, um, random motions of atoms that uh, can just produce a solar system by random collisions with a chance of 1 in 10 to the 10 to the 60, which is a very tiny number, but it's a vastly bigger number than 1 in 10 to the 10 to 123. Now, if I've lost you at this point, here's the important analogy for you to think about. You've got the proverbial monkey sitting at a typewriter for eons and eons on end. Um, many, many billions upon billions of times the age of the universe. Anyway. This monkey eventually comes up with to be or not to be, that is the question. When he does that, 
that corresponds to a universe with life in it. Okay. Now, the problem is that our universe doesn't correspond to to be or not to be, that is the question. Our universe corresponds to the monkey coming up with the complete works of Shakespeare. Now, on the basis of a multiverse, these to be or not to be universes will be uh, <laughs> terribly infrequent, but they will vastly, vastly outnumber the complete works of Shakespeare universes. So on the basis of a multiverse, we would be far more likely to find ourselves in a solar system surrounded by junk, chaos, than in a completely ordered and structured universe out as far as we can see. Um, and I think that is a difficult, if not insuperable, problem for the multiverse idea. Now then, um, uh, this, this, is, this is rather fun, but uh, um, uh, this is a kind of reductio ad absurdum. Uh, serious cosmologists like Paul Davis and John Barrow, the philosopher at Oxford, Nick Bostrom, argue that if you're in a multiverse, then some of these universes will eventually produce civilizations that are more advanced than ours, and these uh, civilizations will start to produce simulations of universes. In fact, it'll be dead easy to do that in comparison with producing new universes <coughs> by creating black holes or whatever. So simulations of universes will start to proliferate. They will start to vastly outnumber real universes. And so we will end up being much, much more likely to be in a, a fake universe, a simulation, like in the film The Matrix, than we will in a real universe. Well, I don't know what you make of that, but uh, so if, if you buy that, it really is a reductio ad absurdum. Now, I think that the theistic explanation, God does provide the ultimate explanation. God explains why there should be life, because he has intentions and purposes for the universe that it do so. And God freely chose to create this particular universe, intending that it produce intelligent creatures. I think God does a much better job. And God is more likely to make an ultra-special universe than one that is just good enough for life to exist in it. This is um, Georges Lemaitre, um, who uh, is become rather a hero of mine, because I learned actually not long after going to St Edmunds College that he had uh, stayed there in 1923-24, spent, spending a year in Cambridge working on his PhD with Arthur Eddington. And he is reputed to have said there were two ways of arriving at the truth, and I decided to follow them both, meaning cosmology and theology, and I still look like that on Sundays sometimes when I'm officiating. Um, so I'm right, I think that's rather fun. And then that, this, is, this is my latest book, which is only just out last week. Um, so I'll stop at that point, and if we've got a bit of time for questions, maybe, I don't know, yeah. for coffee. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I hope you've enjoyed this podcast from Faith and Thought. Next year's symposium will be on the 18th of October and we'll look at the important subject of homosexuality from biblical, scientific and pastoral aspects. So we look forward to seeing you there if possible.